Thanks for opening this recording in the collections of the Camden Local History and Archives Centre. This is a talk about a walk that you can do on the ground. The, talk, uh, the walk was originally commissioned by Camden Council back in 2017 to mark the 50th anniversary of the homosexual law reform passed by the Labour government in 1967. And since, 19, since 2017, it has been a popular walk, which I repeat most years for LGBT plus history month in February. It's a walk that can be completed in about 90 minutes, taking in stories from Fitzrovia, where the, talk begin, where the walk begins, Bloomsbury and King's Cross. We pass places where famous individuals challenge society's norms and conventions governing sexual behavior. We hear about notorious drinking holes where the demi monde gathered uh, and we pass a theater where radical gay and lesbian plays were staged. We hear about the venerable traditions of nocturnal gay cruising and the penalties imposed by the law. And we learn about the solidarity of the LGBT community when faced by the challenge of HIV and AIDS in the 1980s and 1990s. The walk ends at a shop near King's Cross, which uh, hosted a vital lesbian and gay helpline during the years of the HIV and AIDS crisis. Camden is now a supportive environment for the LGBTQI plus community with uh, Georgia Gould on the left of your screen, uh, who is leader of Camden Council, and Sabrina Francis, who was mayor in 2021, celebrating at, at, a, at an event celebrating Pride. Uh, Camden also supports Forum Plus, which is a, an important organization working across Islington and Camden, uh, which um, promotes equality for LGBT people and supports victims of hate crime. And it is Forum Plus who have organized the wonderful program, which is currently being rolled out across Islington and Camden of fantastic events featuring the presence of LGBT people on the screen in many different media. Uh, and indeed, this talk is part of uh, this program. Uh, a convenient starting point for our walk is Good Street Station. But soon we turn into Scala Street, which, as you can see, is a fairly normal central London street. Um, I'm featuring it on this walk because um, it was home to a music hall that existed throughout the 19th and early 20th century, music halls play an important part in LGBT culture. They kept alive a kind of camp culture of vaudeville and burlesque. Uh, they were zones where there was a certain permissiveness towards gender fluidity uh, and many um, female male impersonators or drag kings and male female impersonators, drag queens, uh, could be seen in the programs of music hall acts. Uh, so passing this street quickly, we turn into Charlotte Street and we come to uh, this beautiful tavern, the, one, the Fitzroy Tavern, uh, which was an important center for London's bohemian crowd uh, for many decades from the 20s to the 50s. It attracted a liberal and artistic uh, clientele. Customers enjoyed an atmosphere of raucous fraternity enhanced by loud music from a pianola. Artists, bohemians, writers, intellectuals and drunks came here uh, and continued their um, in, and continued their revels into the night. There was a great deal of fraternization between civilians and the many servicemen who were stationed in London in wartime and in the years of compulsory military service. 
This was, um, and indeed, by the 1950s, this place was described in police reports, and I quote, as a pub full of male homosexuals who dyed their hair and rouged their cheeks and behaved in an effeminate manner with effeminate voices. The other occupants were servicemen, soldiers, sailors, and Marines. And there can be no doubt that this, ho this house was conducted in a most disorderly manner. Perverts were simply overrunning the place and behaving scandalously, attempting to seduce, seduce members of the armed forces. Sounds like fun to me, um, but um, it also, I think, uh, highlights the stereotyping of gay people back in uh, those days. We turn now across, well, we move across Tottenham Court Road to our next stop, which is in Shenny Street. And we're standing just in front of the drill hall. It's now part of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, RADA. And it was originally built for London University students to practice as soldiers. There's even an, uh, an, a rifle range in the basement. The building has housed a theatre group that has perhaps done more than any other to take LGBT issues to a wide audience. Uh, it has supported theatrical and artistic works by gay and lesbian, uh, of, with gay and lesbian themes and promoted gay and lesbian talent staging lesbian pantomimes, gay drama, radical drag shows, camp comedy. It was given a grant by Camden Council who were staunch supporters. The drill hall became a natural focus for political campaigns, most notably against Section 28, which was introduced by Margaret Thatcher's government in 1988 and stated that councils should not and I quote, intentionally promote homosexuality or publish material with the intention of promoting homosexuality in their schools or other areas of their work. This piece of legislation came at a time when the LGBT community was at its most vulnerable during the height of the HIV and AIDS crisis of the, of the 1980s. And the drill hall played a vital role in the campaign for its repeal. In the 90s, the arts, lobby against Section 28 was organized here. The lobby was, was effectively stage managed from Drill Hall and uh, it developed soon into Stonewall, which has achieved a huge amount of legal reform, resulting in profound shifts in attitudes to, to sexual diversity in our time. Um, So this is a very important part of Camden's LGBT heritage. We come now to Russell Square, having passed under the great um, modernist mass of Senate House. Uh, until 2000, uh, when the gardens were closed for their millennium makeover, this was one of the busiest nocturnal cruising grounds in London, second only to Hampstead Heath. Outrage, fronted by Peter Tatchell at the time, was outraged and wrote to the papers because the gardens were locked at night. They said, if local people don't like gay sex in Russell Square, then they should stay away. No one is forcing them to go there. They can visit Bedford Square or Coram's Fields instead. And in any case, what are heterosexuals whingers doing wandering around Russell Square at 2 a.m.? The point I want to make is that outside cruising has a venerable tradition in London. With the appearance of public toilets in the late Victorian, Victorian age, these facilities known as cottages became the obvious and in many cases, the only possible outlet for gay men, especially those in poorer social classes to gain some kind of sexual release. And it's no coincidence that the concept of gross indecency was forced into law at this time. Remember the 50,000 plus convictions 
uh, for this during the 82 years that this law was on the statute book. The most famous cases include those of Sir John Gielgud, the greatest actor, Shakespearean actor, I should say, of the 20th century, and Alan Turing, the great cryptographer. Uh, we, we then move a little way northwards towards Euston Road, and we come to Gordon Square. Today, it mainly houses departments from London University, but in the early 20th century, it was home to a number of distinguished artists, writers, and intellectuals who make up what we now know as the Bloomsbury Group. This is a loose modern term which we use to group together a set of free thinking and free spirited individuals who led unconventional lifestyles with liberal and polymorphous approaches to sexuality, inspiring the description of them as friends who lived in squares, but loved in triangles. They shared a belief that the prime objects in life were love, the creation and enjoyment of aesthetic experience and the pursuit of knowledge. They also had a common desire to challenge the Victorian values and morality of the previous generation. John Maynard Keynes lived at number 46 Gordon Square. He was the most influential economist of the 20th century and also founder of an organization which developed into the Arts Council. In his youth, he was highly distributive with his sexual favors. He kept a little notebook in which he listed 65 casual encounters in 1909, 26 in 1910, and 39 in 1911. His contacts, whose, identity in, whose identities were carefully coded, ranged from encounters met in gyms and swimming pools to conservative MPs. I think this shows that even in spite of strongly enforced laws, a world of casual encounters did exist for those who knew how to find them and had the luxury of their own private accommodation. Further down lived Lytton Strachey, a great biographer and debunker of Victorian heroes. He was openly homosexual, but also had a lifelong love affair with the painter Dora Carrington, who was devoted to him. Strachey spent the last 16 years of his life in a ménage à trois with Dora and her husband Ralph Partridge, in whom he had a strong sexual interest. Very much part of the Bloomsbury group was the great artist Duncan Grant, whose artwork was often defiantly subversive, full of multiracial homoerotica, bursting with passion, love, joy and desire and of course, illegal before the 1967 homosexual law reform. And not far away in Brunswick Square lived Ian e. Forster, the great novelist. He was so cowed by the threat to his literary reputation that he insisted that Maurice, his only openly gay novel, should only be published after his death. One of the characters is based on Strachey, and offers the classic line that the English have never been inclined to accept human nature. Moving on, we come to nearby Tavistock Square, which was home to Virginia Woolf from 1924 to 1939. She is considered by many to be the greatest writer in the English language of the 20th century. In the corner of the square, there is a beautiful bust of Virginia. She lived in a house on the south side of the square uh, and her most famous works came when she was living here, including Mrs. Dalloway, To the Lighthouse and Orlando. In the novel Orlando, the title character lives through three centuries and changes gender several times. The character was inspired by her friend Vita Sackville West with whom Virginia had a long and passionate friendship. The relationship was consummated in sexual terms, even though both were married, and Vita's son, Nigel Nicholson, referred to Orlando as the most beautiful and charming love letter in the English language. It was made into a wonderful film by Sally Potter in 1992 with Tilda Swinton, 
um, and Quentin Crisp in a cameo role as Queen Elizabeth. And there is currently running in the West End um, an adaptation with the title role being played by Emma Corrin, Britain's first self-proclaimed non-binary star. We now proceed eastwards towards Marchmont Street, home of Britain's first LGBT plus bookshop. It was founded in 1979 and offers an unparalleled, uh, unparalleled range of lesbian and gay books. It has also functioned very effectively from its outset as a community and information resource for LGBT people. It has always had a warm and welcoming atmosphere. And when it first opened, it even had a small piano in the back, a tribute to the name of the shop, which comes from the Ivan Novella musical of the same name. After hours, the space has been intensively used over the years by many different LGBT groups, including Icebreakers, an encounter group, lesbian discussion, gray, gay, black and gay disabled groups. Above the shop, there's a plaque to Mark Ashton. He was involved in the most famous episode in the story of this shop when it was used by lesbians and gays to support the miners during the great 1984 to 85 miners strike. This story was made into the 2014 hit film Pride and Mark Ashton, the inspiration and coordinator of the group who organized the wonderful Pits and Perverts Solidarity Concert in support of the miners is now honored by this plaque on the front wall of the shop. The plaque was put up in 2017 to honor him on the 30th anniversary of his death. Mark was a struggler all his life, but sadly he lost his own personal struggle against AIDS in 1987. Marchmont Street is, was also home the childhood home of the brilliant but tragic comic genius Kenneth Williams. Amazingly, his, barber sh uh, his father's barber shop is still a hairdressing salon. Charlie Williams, the dad, was a homophobe and referred, uh, he refused to serve irons as he called them in his shop. Undoubtedly, much of Kenneth's neuroses can be attributed to fear of his father. He found it difficult to establish close relationships with people of either gender. He's remembered now for his flaying nostrils, outlandish costumes, nasal tones, and double entendres, but as seen in the 26 Carry On films in which he starred. We should also remember that his diaries, uh, kept throughout his adult years, are now considered one of the greatest of the 20th century. He made scathing and hurtful comments about almost everybody he worked with, but was brilliantly observant. He was also a fluent speaker of the wonderful gay language of Polari, which he used to brilliant effect on his weekly comedy broadcasts Round the Horn. In, uh, and there's the plaque. We then move towards St. George's Gardens and we come to Wakefield Street, and on the side wall of the London Buddhist Centre, we find this plaque. It celebrates the presence here of Ernest Bolton and Frederick Park, who were better known to history as Fanny and Stella and became notorious cross-dressers. Perhaps transvestism is not something we readily associate with this, with this straight-laced Victorian era. But from 1868 to 1870, they used this house as a house of accommodation. It was run by Martha Stacy, possibly a retired prostitute, and was somewhat different because it was specifically for cross dressers. Martha looked after their dresses, accessories, makeup, and accoutrements. In May 1870, Fanny and Stella were arrested in the Strand, just outside the Strand Theatre, where they had gone in full drag. They had behaved riotously, attracting a large circle of admiring beaux, and the police were waiting for them outside. They were held in cells overnight and appeared still in their female attire at Bow Street Magistrate Court the next morning. They'd been subjected to a humiliating examination 
and were charged with very serious offences, buggery, conspiracy to induce others to commit buggery, and outraging public decency. And we should remember that buggery had been punishable by death until 1861 and was still considered a very serious offence. Uh, just We move on now just up Judd Street to find the newly spruced up Camden Town Hall, which was the scene of the final moments in a hard fought race to be the very first venue in the country to host, to host a same sex wedding on the 29th of March, 2014. The couple who exchanged their vows that night at one minute past midnight were amongst the first to exercise their legal right to do so in the country. Their wedding was witnessed by Camden's openly gay mayor, Jonathan Simpson, and the registrar, who was also openly gay. With marriage equality, a powerful and positive message was sent out that we are all equal, whether straight or gay. And Britain is now one of 32 countries where there is marriage equality. My final picture is of Houseman's Bookshop just the other side of King's Cross Station at the bottom end of Caledonian Road. It's just outside our area, but it's worthy of honorable mention in this walk, as it was home for many years to the London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard, which provided a vital service to the LGBT plus community. In the 1980s, at the height of the HIV and AIDS crisis, they were receiving over 100,000 calls a year before the National AIDS Helpline was established, providing vital information and support to terrified gay people and their families and friends. Its staff compiled the first National AIDS Manual, which, was, which has now developed into a vital compendium of information on the condition. Switchboard remains an important resource for the LGBT community, but has now moved to larger premises. We have now passed the 40th anniversary of the first appearance of an unknown condition, which because so many gay men were affected, was first called GRID or gay related immune deficiency. The first public meeting to discuss the new health crisis in this country was held in Conway Hall on Red Lion Square, also in Camden. It was convened by the London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard and uh, the gay medical group based at University College Hospital in May 1983. And the first home of the Terence Higgins Trust, named for the first British man to have died from AIDS on the 4th of July 1982, was in Gray's Inn Road, also in our borough. The Trust was the first and remains the largest charity working in the field of HIV and AIDS care. From the outset, it provided support to HIV positive people with home help, counselling, nutritional support and buddying. At a time when parts of the popular press were routinely referring to HIV and AIDS as the gay plague, it faced out to the public and played a vital role in promoting a better public understanding of the condition. It worked with passion all around the country, ramming home the message of protection and safer sex as though life depended on it, which of course it did. It raised money for support and research, and it held the fort and helped thousands of terrified gay men and their families and friends. Um, so here we see uh, members of the Terence Higgins Trust uh, campaigning on the streets. We can conclude now that Camden undoubtedly has a rich heritage of places which have played an important part in the story of the LGBT community over time. And you can walk around and see these places if you follow the route that I have outlined in this presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, that is the end of the presentation. <laughs>